Yes, and now we can jump straight into the next session, um, which will be given by Trent, who's talking about the Web3 data economy ocean protocol. Please give it up for Trent. Uh, pick us that. All right, hi everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, thanks for coming to learn more about the data side of the Web3 world. I'm from Ocean Protocol. Let's get started. So many of the talks today have talked about um, the data silos. And it's kind of amazing. Every time you turn around, you kind of learn a new peril in the world. For example, when I signed up for Gmail back in 2005, Google had promoted, don't be evil, don't be evil. And um, you know, I'm like, great, you know, this is going to be OK. This is going to be OK. But in this summer, there was an article from the Wall Street Journal that Google has been selling all of your Gmail data, plain text, attachments, everything, to hundreds of companies. This means thousands of developers actually have full access to read your Gmail all the time. How does that make you feel? Don't be evil died a long time ago. It's sort of Google's arbitrage on the world to, well, people form. Facebook too, right? Um, a great example, of course, is a couple years ago, the election. There was all these Russian bots that basically tipped the scales so that we have an interesting American president um, compared to, well, maybe you know, another choice. So at the summary of this is this realization that data is money. Um, and this was sort of the, the title of an article from The Economist um, a year and a half ago, where it's been framed as the world's most valuable resource. Um, data is the new oil, all these sorts of things, right? And um, it's led to these problems, like those I've talked about, which comes down to this challenge of data silos. Incentives are all kind of mixed up. We, we have this sort of Web 2 that we didn't want, rather than the Web 2 that we wanted. What can we do about this? So let's look around for some inspiration. And the inspiration, of course, it goes back to, well, another crisis that we faced back in 2008, the financial crisis, uh, where the banks, et cetera, had, well, you know, um, gathered together a bunch of money and spent it on these credit default swaps and so on. And at the end of the day, who was left holding the keys? The taxpayers. So this is a photo of people trying to go and get their money from their bank. And of course, they don't have the keys to their money. The bank has the keys to their money. So to paraphrase Andreas Antonopoulos, um, not your keys, not your money, right? And what did this lead to? Directly, it led to Bitcoin, right? And that was actually the spark um, right on the heels of the financial crisis. And of course, that spark led to the overall blockchain economy that has emerged. Um, so the token economy um, has been opening up the concept of money, right? We have gone from this world this sort of shadow money economy with the feds, with the banks, which is opaque, which has concentrated power. And instead, it's been, we've been moving towards this world that is transparent, that is permissionless, the token economy, with things like Bitcoin, Ether, and so on. And you know, this, this conference and all the conferences and events and stuff around it are all sort of a manifestation of what's been going on there. What I'm going to talk about in my talk today is, hey, we can use this as an inspiration, just as we've been opening up money through the movement of decentralization, let's open up data as well. And that's actually a lot of what Web3 is about, is opening up data, right? There's a shadow data economy out there right now. Facebook and Google together have a market cap of around a trillion dollars, right? Um, that's pretty big, yet it's opaque. The power is concentrated, right? We have King Zuckerberg over the, his fiefdom of two billion people, right? Let's lead that into a Web3 data economy that is much more transparent, and permissionless. The question is how? What does this actually look like? So let's move towards a solution. And there is there's a, a key thing that's at the heart of this, and that is artificial intelligence, AI. And this isn't the sort of like, you know, meet the Turing test AI stuff. This is simply building models. Models that map inputs to outputs to do classification, regression, all of this, in order to serve up ads to you, the people, right? The more data you have, the more accurate you can serve ads, and so on. The challenge is um, there's a lot of data out there, actually, within enterprises, within NGOs, and so on. And um, the thing is, those enterprises, they don't actually have a lot of AI people in them. They ha have a tough time attracting AI people to come. Why? Because all those AI people have gone off to form their own startups to try to make money from AI. And those startups, interestingly, are finding, oh, man, we don't have any data. 
And there's only a small handful of companies that have said, hey, you know, let's have the data and let's actually attract AI people and actually get them to stick around. Who are they? Sure enough, Google, Facebook, and a handful of others. That's it. And that's actually where all the value is being extracted into this very, very small group of organizations. AI, artificial intelligence, is the linchpin. But what if we could connect all these data haves, people with the data, the enterprises, the NGOs, et cetera, with the startups that are starving for data, right? The, the AI haves. But, so what if we could create a substrate that connects these folks, that helps to equalize the opportunities for leveraging AI via leveraging data via AI? That's what we're aiming for with Ocean. So to drill into that a bit more, um, at the heart of it, we have the data owners and the data scientists. The data scientists are trying to build the models, and the data owners are these enterprises, governments. Governments often actually have mandates to open up their data. You know, this could be city governments, municipal governments, all the way to state governments and national governments. And of course, NGOs, you know, um, dozens of different UN agencies who actually uh, are trying to work with data, but actually don't have a lot of the expertise to do so, right? And of course, they, uh, there's the networks around that are providing data and compute. So imagine if we could have um, a whole bunch of different data marketplaces out there, buying and selling data um, for different industries and verticals, for automotive, for medical, and so on, as well as an AI commons. Imagine if side by side with priced data, we could have free data in a way that incentivizes people to actually supply to that commons. So that's sort of the supply side. And then, of course, the demand side is easy. Um, AI uh, people, data scientists who are building AI models, um, they know that their AI will um, take as much data as possible. So the, the demand side is easy. It's really about getting the supply side there. So the data scientists, they have problems to solve, and they use their traditional tools like scikit-learn, TensorFlow, and so on. So what Ocean is about as this Web3 data economy is a connecting substrate to incentivize and make it really easy to connect the dots to get the data um, used. So first of all, within the world of Bitcoin, Bitcoin is... Um, paying you block rewards to maximize the security of the Bitcoin network. It defines security as the hash rate. And then it, um, your expected block rewards is proportional to your, uh, how much hash rate you provide to the Bitcoin network. Right? But we can do the same thing with data itself. Your expected block rewards can be proportional to how much you have staked and if you serve that data or not, how popular that data is. By doing this, it's actually incentivizing people to contribute to the data commons and beyond. So this is one part of helping to incentivize. But there's another part. There's a whole bunch of enterprises. They have all this data. But it's not like they're just going to give it to the, the commons right away. They're really worried. Maybe it has PII, all of that, right? But what if there is a way to sort of try out and get some value from it anyway and learn about how this all works? Or maybe if it is really like PII stuff, then you can't, um, you know, it can never leave their premises. Things like German medical data can not leave German soil. What do you do? And the answer is, you bring the compute to the data itself, right? So um, to avoid these data escapes, what you can do is you have this middleware layer, um, composed of ocean, et cetera, that has the incentives and permissions. And then you have private data that stays private behind a firewall. And with that, you privately train on the model. You, you create this private model. And then only the predictions get made available. The predictions are various analytics and so on. And by doing this, you're actually getting the benefits of building the models and so on. Yet at the same time, you're retaining the privacy. Um, that you need to retain. So the data stays behind the firewall. So this is actually the core idea of Ocean. Uh, there's a few ways to frame it, if you guys are kind of still trying to figure out, OK, how do I wrap my head around this? So one way is, um, in fact, I'll go backwards for a second. Um, I'm sure who here has bought airline tickets via Kayak or via any other site? I'm sure everyone, right? Great, everyone, of course. And uh, so many of you flew here. Thank you. Um, and uh, so with this, you go to Kayak, and you search, and you get flights coming from, um, used to be Air Berlin, uh, but Air Canada and other uh, airlines. And it's all in one site, say Kayak. Now, if you go to Expedia, or if you go to another site, you're actually going to see the same flights. It's different interfaces for the same data. Why? Because under the hood, there's actually one common substrate, some, one common database that all of these different systems use. It's Sabre and Am Amadeus kind of merged, OK? And this has been around for decades. And what's kind of amazing is, on top of that, we have various data marketplaces that have emerged to buy and sell um, these airline tickets, right? And at the end of the day, once it's bought, then um, the airline supplies that ticket. 
So that's actually what I have on the left here. The supply of tickets is from the airlines. And then the consuming of the tickets is the consumer travelers, the business people. And in between, you have all these things like Expedia, Kayak, Hipmunk, as well as travel agents, third-party resellers, you know, and so on. Well, Ocean itself is like Sabre for data itself. So you have a whole bunch of data marketplaces that can build on top of Ocean. It's really easy. You have, have the right permissioning, set up all that, as well as different websites for AI Commons. And they're all, ac all accessing the same underlying listing registry of what data is being made available, right? Some of the metadata, not all, and it's, it's straightforward and it's privacy preserving and all of that. That's really what Ocean is about that way. Another way of framing is simply an AI compute pipeline. So if any of you guys have done AI type work, you have things like um, MapReduce, um, Hadoop, um, Apache, Flink, these sorts of things. These are all sort of DAGs for compute that are used by the big data world. Uh, Ocean itself helps to manifest these, these compute DAGs um, where you have data coming in and then going to compute, then going to storage and so on, right? So Ocean itself, um, it's not just about providing data. Um, that's the goal. But sometimes you actually need to connect different pieces um, in order to handle the privacy, like I talked about before. Another way of framing Ocean is an inter-service network. So um, it's connecting. It's a network of networks, but it's connecting around various services. So we can have services around data. You can have fully decentralized data coming from, say, Filecoin. You can have um, cloud-type data coming from, say, S3. Or you can have data coming from behind a firewall. Same thing for compute. Fully decentralized compute, um, say, with Golem, or maybe privacy-preserving compute. Uh, that way, Enigma. Uh, or uh, centralized compute behind your firewall or cloud-based compute, like EC2. All of these can connect into Ocean. Um, and that when they provide these services, it's treated as a service that's verifiable. So Ocean can be viewed as an overall inter-service network with a, a layer of curation. As well, you can actually just think of it as a network of networks. So just like Web3 with Polkadot, et cetera, is a network connecting various networks um, that have the, the underlying relay chain, uh, these parachains and stuff. Well, um, Ocean, you can view it as one layer on top of that. That's sort of the crypto perspective, right? So there's a whole bunch of networks. It's incentivizing these networks to work together and join because they're getting block rewards to be part of the Ocean network. And that would be the crypto perspective. Now, if you're an AI person building these data models, um, then you're just thinking about uh, it's just an L1 network and that. So on the left side, this is the crypto perspective. It's sort of L2 on L1. From the AI perspective, it's simply uh, L1. So what does this look like, right? And um, you know, if you're going to use Ocean, what does it look like? Well, um, probably most of you here are crypto people, not data scientists. Actually, I should ask, how many of you here are data scientists or played with models, played with AI, played with neural networks? Not that many. OK, cool. But a few. Great. So um, Ocean, first and foremost, is actually for data scientists, right? And if you're a data scientist, uh, you have tools to go and build um, your model and, and deploy it, right? What do these tools look like? Well, up here, um, this is something called IPython, Interactive Python. Python, by the way, is the main library used by people building these models that usually glues to something below with it built in C or something. And um, so Ocean, basically, the idea is make it where data scientists get to keep using the same tools they've always used. This here, it's interactive Python, but there's other things too, like MapReduce, Spark, Jupyter, Zeppelin, these sorts of things. It's a different Zeppelin than the crypto Zeppelin. <laughs> um, you know, scikit-learn, all of these things. And here's the cool thing. Um, if you're just consuming services for free, like data for free from the data commons, um, you don't have to do anything else. It's just part of the libraries that will be getting included in things like scikit-learn. Um, but if you want to buy services or sell services, this is where you can integrate um, MetaMask and other wallets um, into your flows. And we actually have um, working code on this already. So now it's basically IPython no notebook talking to crypto wallets. So this, to us, is the future of data science usage, right? You get to stay in your, your tool flows that you always know as a data scientist. But now you can actually access the services and, and pay for them uh, with uh, crypto wallets. If you're a data scientist, why would you use this? Use this? There's three main reasons. Way more data, right? And uh, researchers have known for a long, long time that if you have more data, you get way more accurate models, right? Um, so if you have you know, 10x, 100x, 1,000x more data, you can bring your error rate from 25% down to 5% to 1% to 0.1%. And that makes all the difference in whether your model is deployable or not. You know, a great example of self-driving cars, right? Would you get into a self-driving car if the accident rate was 25% or the error rate? <laughs> Probably not, right? But if it's one in a million, then that might be pretty OK, because that's much safer than getting into a car driven by a human. right? And what makes all the difference in the world is data. right? And not just 10x more data, but 1,000x and more. Right? Another new power for data scientists, the reason if you're going to use this is provenance. right? So 
uh, if you're going to actually build a model, where did that data come from? Right? Or for the example of self-driving cars, if a car crashes, you want to know what happened. Can you explain what happened? And you need to know what went into training that model. It's, and with that, think of it like a black box in an airplane. If an airplane crashes, you know what's going on. Well, that's the dream of self-driving cars um, as well. And in fact, it's even potentially um, the law because GDPR, uh, the European Data Protection Rules, have r laws around explainability of the models. So now you have provenance. You get to see the history of the training. And finally, more money, right? If, if you're a data scientist, it, let's say you're a PhD student, and you're probably poor then, uh, and you invent them some super cool algorithm, then imagine if you can make money from that algorithm directly by, treating, by putting it up as a service. This is actually now possible with Ocean. Or if you know that some data sets are really awesome, you can actually curate on it and serve it up and make money that way. Or, or if you're cleaning data or labeling data and so on. So these are new powers for data scientists. Of course, there's ways to manage data sets with you know, private keys, all that. Um, we use bonding curves as a way to curate data sets. Um, and that kind of gives you a flavor of how this thing is used. But then the question is, like, what are the applications? Well, a big one is autonomous vehicles, right? Um, where we can have um, much greater mobility um, at lower cost. And the big challenge actually is um, the number of miles driven. We don't have accurate enough models now because we don't have enough uh, data. Uh, people have calculated we need 500 billion miles driven. This is going to take 10 years or 20 years for the big automakers to get to. But what if you pool the data together? This is actually what the Mobi Foundation is doing. They have 70% of the world's auto production. Toyota Research, BMW, GM, for these sorts of companies are working together to pool their data. Another application that we're, um, we're working with is Connected Life, um, which is building models to predict Parkinson's. Um, and how? Well, way more data and privacy preserving data, right? And um, if you're a researcher, you're happy if you have a data set of 50 or 100 people. Now imagine, though, if you can have a data set of 100,000 people while privacy preserving. Keeping going, uh, agriculture. So there's a spin-off from the World Economic Forum called Grow Asia, and it's about giving farmers way more data such that they can more accurately predict how much fertilizer to put in, how much seed to give, and so on. So that's going to be a very nice benefit. Um, the government of Singapore data authorities, um, if you think about you know, the, the, the history of the GDPR, right? Um, these people, these, law, these uh, policymakers came up with GDPR, these rules, based on the technology of the time, right? And it was kind of hard. A lot of it is heavy-handed here and there, but it has some nice benefits too. But imagine if you could thread the needle a bit better, simply because there's better trade-offs between privacy and provenance and so on. So giving more optionality to these policymakers is very nice, and this is actually what we're doing with the government of Singapore. Um, curation, we can explore curation with um, applications like Music Map. It's, uh, if you go to musicmap.info, you'll see um, a way to explore genres and then see how that maps to playlists. We're going to be inserting um, blockchain-based curation into that application. And the AI Commons, this is an example where um, there's a whole bunch of UN agencies, more than 40 of them now, that have been coming to a conference called AI Commons, sorry, AI for Good, learning about how they can help uh, promote these UN 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and they've all realized, wow, at the heart of this, uh, we need data. And in fact, we have all these people with these problems, but we don't have a way to connect to the people that know how to solve the problems, the data scientists. And that's really what, what this is about. The Web3 data substrate, Ocean, uh, in this AI for Good application. So I've talked about some of the applications, um, but what does this actually look like as an economy, right? I mean, that's what a lot of um, blockchains are designed to be, these public utility networks, but not just a utility network, but a full-on economy. Well, we'd have been asking that question, and we said, well, there is this token economy, this money economy that we've had, and there's sort of a base layer. We've got the reserve currency, Bitcoin, the store of value. There's the app platform or unit exchange, like Ethereum. It's probably the main one. And an app funding platform, um, Ethereum as well. SAFTs as well these days, too. Um, and then along that, we have last miles in terms of utility. This is dApps, but also last miles in terms of the economic layer. This is um, the custodians or wallets, you know, Coinbase, Trezor, Metamask, uh, token exchanges, um, GDAX, Binance, that sort of thing, and mining, right, Bitmain, et cetera. So this is sort of a snapshot of what you could frame the data economy as. So we said, what if the data economy looked like a token economy, at least as a first approximation, right? So um, that's the blue on the right. And once again, we have the reserve currency, the unit of exchange, the, f the data or asset funding platform, and then the last miles, right? So we asked, OK, if it looked like this, um, how well does the design actually fulfill these goals of a data economy? How, or how do we instantiate this data economy, right? We need to fill in each of those. So to start with, at, at the heart of Ocean, I've mentioned this briefly, rewarding, you want to reward making relevant data available. 
And to, how do you measure relevance? You don't measure it, you let people stake on it. So you're using economic incentives or economics as a means to signal whether a data set is relevant or not. And at the heart of that, we're using bonding curves. And the way that a bonding curve works, think of it like a, a robot that um, it starts off where it's selling tokens in that new asset, call it DX, drops of X, uh, and that new asset initially has zero tokens. But once you start buying it for super cheap, then it mints those tokens, and they start to get more expensive over time. And if you sell some of those new tokens, those drops of X, then it burns those. So it's sort of a continuous mint, continuous burn. And this is actually the heart of bonding curves. They're sort of robots that are making the market, if you will, there to buy and sell. So with these bonding curves at the heart of Ocean, then if you think about it, when you launch, when you register a data asset into Ocean, then it's essentially a mini ICO of that data asset. And initially, there's no tokens, but as soon as someone starts um, staking into it, then it's actually issuing those tokens of that data asset. It's ICOing it, essentially. It's a mini ICO of that data asset. Uh, also, um, the more um, tokens that have been staked into one of these bonding curves, um, then the more you have in reserve currency. So the area under the curve is actually a reserve which is kind of amazing. So there's actually this reserve currency for data assets that naturally falls out of bonding curves. And finally, what about the unit of exchange? And the unit of exchange actually comes from buying and selling these services, whether it's data or compute or some of the orchestration uh, within these networks. So um, buying data with Ocean uh, as a pass-through then an automatic um, exchange to you know, spend US dollars or to spend Filecoin, et cetera. Together, these fulfill the base layer of the data economy. So we've been asking, what does the data economy look like? If it starts to look like the token economy, it's like, hey, cool. We actually have this design that um, has the reserve currency, the unit of exchange, and the funding platform. What about the top? Well, uh, from the last mile for the economic side, we've got the tokens uh, that are managed via wallets, whether it's MetaMask or Balance or even new wallets that get designed just for the data economy. And it's kind of amazing. You know, within this data economy, we could have 10,000 data sets or even a million, right? So we think we have the long tail of tokens right now. It's about to get orders of magnitude larger, right? So it'll be interesting to see how that gets managed. Um, and that's actually a really fun UX challenge for those of you who are wallet designers out there. Uh, the, there's existing data exchanges, um, centralized ones. They're, they're going to um, be incentivized to um, start supplying data from this new supply. Or the crypto exchanges, they have a lot more tokens to sell if they want, right? Um, for the, all the various networks that Ocean is actually incentivizing to be a part, whether it's part of the Web3 networks with Polkadot, with Filecoin, et cetera, um, it's actually going to be a really great channel to um, incentivize them to be part of this so they get a lot more users, a lot more capabilities for the users. And finally, I've talked about for the applications themselves, this is really about superpowers for the data scientists, people building the models. So overall, there's a ways to catalyze this last mile for utility and for finance. So to kind of summarize there, um, this question of what does the Web3 data economy look like? Well, the Web3 data economy looks a lot like the Web3 token economy um, as a baseline. You know, the implementation details are different, but that's actually a very interesting realization. So to conclude, data is money. Let's open it in Web3. So just like with money, we we're moving from this shadow money economy to a token economy that is per transparent and permissionless. Same thing with data. We're moving from a shadow data economy to a transparent and permissionless data economy. Thank you very much. At five, do you want to start on? I'm not sure how it works. Question here, do we? Yeah, we pass okay. the mic around. All right, cool. Um, I was wondering what kind of realistic expectations should we set on uh, latency and data throughput? So I'm talking about the point when data is produced up to the point when the data can be consumed. And yeah. Uh, so overall, um, Ocean is used sort of to manage the permissions uh, to access data. But then let's say that I'm, giving, I'm, I'm sending data to you. Um, it's not going through the Ocean network. It's me connecting to you directly. So um, it's however we set up that connection in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion or whatever, right? Um, and if, if it tends to have latency, then there will uh, naturally things like CDNs will emerge around that, right? So it's um, no different than the issues today of content distribution that we see right now. 
Um, so once again, Ocean is really about um, connecting the permissions. The data itself does not have to flow through the Ocean network, right? I mean, we don't want petabytes flowing through blockchains. That's just a recipe for disaster, right? At least right now. Questions? Uh, over there, to the left. Uh, yeah, so I have way too many questions to ask here right now, but uh, one of the main questions I would have is about the incentive system. Um, I'm a bit skeptical about that. So my question is, if I would be, let's say, a pharmaceutical company or anything like that, uh, wouldn't it be more valuable to me to silo my data than uh, the benefits I would get to actually share it to anyone else because the data is the actual value we would get from it? Yeah, so uh, pharmaceutical is a lot of medical data and stuff, right? So that's probably not going to end up in the comments at all, no matter what, right? And it's a bad idea to do but, so. But, but this, yeah. this is, this, we, can, we could say this about any kind of data. I mean, also self-driving cars. If I yeah. would be a self-driving car company, yeah. why would I share the data? Yeah, so here's the thing. Um, with Ocean, you can actually keep the data private behind firewalls, or you can put it into the commons, and it depends on the use case. So there's a lot of data that's naturally commons data, and there's other data, though, where you um, want to build models from the data, but you actually want to preserve privacy. And the cool thing is that's, now, that's possible when you bring the compute to the data, and you can preserve privacy. If you want to get really crazy, you can even build models off of encrypted data using things like homomorphic encryption. But, but in that case, you would not get the advantage of having a lot of data available, because you can just use the data of that that specific entity. Uh, well, here's the thing, right? Imagine I'm an automaker and I want to build a model off for self-driving cars. I can go take the data from Toyota and from GM and from Ford and from BMW, and I can make a model across all of those. And it's basically doing federated learning, a little bit of learning off of each data set. So that's actually how you get to learn across various silos um, while preserving privacy. There's a way to thread the needle. It's so silent here. <laughs> hey there. So one of my biggest concerns um, it's uh, about the, the appearance of a malicious actor that, for example, could be reselling the data. Um, so what's how can we prevent uh, basically that someone buys the, the buy data and basically the free free rider problem for for uh, up in in this protocol? So could you elaborate specifically because there's quite a few variants. Uh, so someone buys the data and then what happens is your concern? So imagine that uh, instead of uh, using the Ocean protocol in order to serve this, this data. I decide to buy it and share it for free. Uh, yeah, so if I'm, if I'm an owner of data and I'm super worried about my data escaping, say you buy it and then you spread it to the world, um, then um, if I'm super concerned about that or if there's privacy laws like you know German medical data, can't leave German soil, then um, I'm not going to ever let that data leave my, fire, uh, my, my premise. Instead, I'll bring the compute to the data. So if data escapes is a concern, that's when you bring the compute to the data. That's really key. But in other cases, if I have data that I think deserves to be part of the commons, then I will put it out there. Um, and uh, I will serve it up w um, whenever people ask. And other people can say, hey, this is great data. They'll download it, and they'll start serving it up too. And we expect that um, popular data sets, um, maybe there's going to be 100 or 10,000 people serving up a popular data set, and they're all co co collectively staking on this and getting gains. And there is a first mover advantage in this too because of the shape of bonding curves. So remember, the more that I stake on the data, the more that I get in block rewards. And um, uh, the earlier the stake, uh, the earlier that I stake on it, the more stake I get. So there's a first mover advantage. So the person who serves up that data set first and stakes on it first is actually getting the most bang for the buck that way. All right. Yep. Uh, wait. We can actually take more questions. I just want to make a short announcement. Um, there's a pop-up node that is now teaching people on how to set up Polkadot nodes. So if any of you are interested in running Polkadot nodes, uh, I think you can follow Josh over there. Just give a wave. Cool. And yeah, we have like a bunch more minutes for questions as well. We have a couple more minutes? Uh, we have like five more minutes. Oh, great. Cool. Easily. Look at that. All right. More questions. Awesome. They keep popping out now. Great. Hi. Um, right here. 
Hi. Um, my main concern is with your incentive model, how are you going to disincentivize companies like Google and Facebook and other centralized organizations who already control the most of our data now from being the primary users of your network later? That's a great question, actually, right? So um, and what ultimately, the vision, of course, is you know, we all have this a vision of self-sovereign data, right? So um, my personal data, I'm controlling myself, and I'm giving permissions to others. And if I don't like what Google is doing with my data, I can revoke permissions, right? So that's the, the, near, that's the medium and longer term goal. And the near term, if I've already given consent to Google for my data for the next while, then Google might very well do that. The, will they? The, um, go ahead. The problem now is that you can't revoke your consent from Google and Facebook owning your data because you've already signed agreements that say they own it now. Exactly, exactly. So I was getting to that, right? So they have my data now. And um, frankly, you know, I dislike the fact that they've arbitraged me. You know, they weren't evil before. Or they claimed not to be. And now they got rid of that. Um, so uh, we have to get over it, the fact that they have the data now that I've given consent for. But as time goes on, that personal data that I have now, um, if, if I stop using Google tomorrow, um, then that, the value of that data will go down, 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 right? So um, I do anticipate that some of the big companies will come in there and use it. Um, but they're, uh, over time, uh, as o Ocean is designed to sort of erode at, at the walls of this such that there's more opportunities for others. And in fact, if any of you are out there in the audience, you know, there's one really, really cool thing about GDPR. I'll, I'll tell an anecdote because this relates. Um, about five years ago, a friend of mine, uh, he asked Facebook for all his personal data, and the law said he had to give it. So six months later, six months, they gave him his personal data, printed out in a stack of paper like this, right? And why? That's, that's all that they had to do. They had, it, it was OK if there was a delay. It was OK if it wasn't machine readable. GDPR changed that for the world. So what this means now is if you have personal data, you can actually, like for Facebook or Google, you can say, hey, I want all my data. And you can download it and um, get all of it um, in a machine readable fashion. And they supply it within days, because I've done this you know, after I deleted my Facebook, for example. That, that felt great, by the way. Um, and uh, so the cool thing is, any of you out there who are building these you know, um, applications for self-sovereign data, this is a tool. This is the Achilles heel of Google and Facebook. You can go in there and grab the data, make it really easy for your users to grab the data from Facebook and put it onto your platform with a better UX and the proper permissioning. And to me, this is actually how we, we chop up the knees of these, these people that are people farming us. Thanks, really enjoyed the presentation. So my question is around if I was to sell my data to Ocean, um, how does that valuation or the staking mechanism interact if I was to resell that data, right? So if, I, cause if it's my data and I have control of it, if there's six other Ocean protocols or six other corporates that are trying to buy, buy data, how does that data value uh, go into the future if I can continue to resell it? Yeah, so um, generally it's going it's, uh, through a marketplace, right? And that marketplace will set up the terms and conditions. And your data actually follows copyright law. So this is actually just like uh, if I sell my, my personal data to you, um, then there's going to be a, a license that you, you have, in this case, uh, if you choose this way, but it has to follow the law. So it has a, a license that's literally a contract. And with that contract, it will actually stipulate conditions around whether reselling is possible, yes or no, yes or no, right? Now, that's sort of the, the legal side. But generally, you, know, you want to have sort of default to make it really easy to um, you know, 99%. Um, for the sunny days, you want to make it the technical, the technology to follow this. And you only want to have recourse to the legals for the last 1%. So you have the recourse because of these, these contracts. Um, uh, and at the end of the day, myself, if I sell the data to you, um, I can't really prevent you, if you grab the data, I can't prevent you from going and pasting it all over the world, right? I can't do anything about that. If I really don't want you to do this, then once again, bring the compute um, to myself, right? So always um, bringing compute to yourself is the way to absolutely avoid data escapes. Or I can say, hey, you know what? I'm going to um, draw on the, the um, long arm of the law in order to prevent data escapes. So you know, you're going to court if you use my data that's not according to um, the rules that I set up, right? So it's kind of up to myself, or court, or third-party arbitration, or whatever. Um, and it's kind of a, a challenge, right? Because you want to make it really easy to uh, really easy to uh, monetize the data if you can. But um, these these are how you reconcile it, right? So you're giving the user the choice: either bring the computer to the data, or leverage third-party arbitration. We won't have more time for questions right now, but I think Trent will be outside for the AMA session, right? So yeah, thank you very much.